Yep. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Topology Optimization Webinar. Today, we have a special edition. It is not about topology optimization algorithm, but it's about software, open source software and building software communities. This edition is organized by Professor Anisha Kim and uh, Dr. Jiru Byung from University of California at San Diego. Thank you for organizing this session. Please take over. Uh, can I share my screen? Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for attending this webinar. Uh, first of all, it is great honor to co-host this special session of 20th top webinar uh, on the future of scientific and engineering computing in research community and industry. Um, as Professor Jun introduced. Uh, my name is Jay Yop Hyun, a project scientist working with uh, uh, Professor Alicia Kim, uh, who is our main co-host for this webinar. And we are coming from the UC San Diego. So uh, through this opening, I would like to briefly mention the background behind this special, this special session and its logistics and program uh, timeline. Uh, so far, you know, as you know, the top webinar series has been focusing on presenting research progresses. So it would be great to make a step further to discuss general issues related to our top level optimization community, like uh, open source benchmarking problem, data set, industrial challenges, etc. cetera. Um, all, fortunately, along this line, um, there were timely some discussions uh, at the last WCSM, um, that some ISMO members would like to initiate an open source software discussion in our community. Uh, meanwhile, as we all may know, uh, topology optimization code could be very diverse uh, according to its design parameterization methods, physics solver, or uh, design variable updating algorithms, and so on. So, so, so that we know it is very, very challenging to construct and develop a standard topology optimization code itself. Um, however, standardization in the right direction in developing and utilizing of various open source software, including the topology optimization code is quite possible story. So, along this background, we, we invited two experts from the scientific and engineering computing research community. So the first speaker is Dr. Daniel Kotz. He is a, a research associate professor from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And he, also, he is also an uh, internationally leading expert in uh, fostering open source software practice and scientific computing communities. And the second speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Justin Gray coming from the NASA clan uh, is a, uh, and also he is a very well known uh, systematic analyst and design optimization expert in NASA. And since 2010, he has uh, read the development of NASA's Open MBAO framework, which is an op uh, multidisciplinary open source uh, optimization platform. Uh, so this uh, is a uh, today's uh, program timeline. So after this. My opening, uh, firstly, the Dr. Daniel Kotz will be presenting about building software community. And then Dr. Justin uh, Gray will be giving a presentation on please steal my research. I will uh, tell you anything you want to know. And after two presentations, there will be an open discussion on open source software benchmarking in uh, topology optimization. Uh, will be moderated by uh, Professor Alicia Kim. So for, and also just for your information, uh, please uh, ask some questions for, to, for the two presentations in this open discussions. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, so let's get started with the first presentation. So Dr. Daniel Katz, please uh, go ahead.
Okay, thank you very much. Um, I just want to start by um, by thanking the, the organizers for the opportunity to do this. Um, and I uh, kind of was talking with Alicia, Alicia a couple of times over the last uh, couple of months, and it, it seemed like this was going to be an interesting topic, hopefully for this group. Um, I'll say that I'm working with a bunch of different co-authors from a bunch of different communities. And when I started talking to them about um, helping to, uh, to develop this talk, which um, hopefully will turn into a paper later, um, their, their first question was, what is topology optimization? And, uh, and my answer was, well, I, I don't actually know, but let's, let's go ahead anyhow. Um, so, so this, uh, right, as, as was stated, this is gonna be a little bit different and hopefully it is interesting um, because I think the rules that we're trying to develop about how software communities form and, and develop software within those communities um, is, is hopefully applicable to this community as well. And so hopefully there's something that you will um, learn from the other communities and that can be applied here. Uh, so, okay, so let me go ahead. Um, so first, uh, just why are, we, why are we talking about software and research? Um, in the US, we can look at funding for, uh, for research and we can see that over an 11 year period, um, shortly before 2017, 20% uh, of the National Science Foundation projects topically discussed software in their abstracts. And so this was about 10 billion US dollars that NSF was investing in these projects. Uh, in the Department of Energy that has the Exascale Computing Program, there are uh, two of the three main areas really are research software. And that's about $4 billion that, uh, that the Department of Energy is investing. We can also look at uh, publications. Um, Software intensive projects are a majority of current publications across fields. And the most cited papers are typically either methods papers or software papers. Um, and we can also ask researchers. So we've done surveys of researchers in the US and the UK. And we found that uh, more than 90% of those researchers use research software as part of their research. Uh, about 65% wouldn't be able to do their research without that software. Uh, again, this is across all fields. Um, and about 50% develop software as part of their research. So, so software is important in research, uh, essential in a lot of research. Um, if we think about research communities, we can think about them in a few different ways. Um, so one of them is scale, that we can think about a, a group of people in a discipline that are working together on a single problem or a set of groups in a discipline working together on a set of problems. We can also think uh, about disciplines in some sense. Right, that, uh, that you can have a group of people in a discipline working on a problem or a group of people in multiple disciplines working together on a problem. Um, and we can think that these community members have a bunch of different roles. Some people are professional researchers, maybe at national labs or companies. Uh, some are faculty members or postdocs or students, and some are professional staff, uh, people like data scientists or research software engineers or, or project managers. Um, and intellectually and, and technically, the more inclusive and diverse the group is, uh, the better the research ends up being usually. Oops, sorry. Um, and, and so we can think of research communities in, as an expansion of an older idea called team science. And uh, team science has been a, an area of study in, in the life sciences for quite a long time um, at this point. So then thinking about software within these research communities, um, there's a bunch of general issues that, um, that we started thinking about before we actually went into looking at the communities in detail. And these are things like, we want to have some competition uh, within a research community, but not too much, right? So we need, we don't wanna have kind of one set of software that solves problems. We'd like to have maybe two sets of software. Um, we probably don't want to have 10 sets of software that do the same thing. So there's some kind of balance here of being about necessary duplication and unnecessary duplication. And it's also worth considering that uh, software development for education is fairly important, that for students to learn uh, by developing new software that is a duplicate in some cases of old software is good, um, but to use that in production may not be necessary if there already is existing production quality software. You can also think about adding to existing software instead of creating new software. So if I have something that I want to do and I can find something that 
um, that is 90% of it. And I can add the other 10% to that community software rather than building everything myself. Um, that's probably better. You can also think about creation versus maintenance and funding. Um, funding agencies typically get really excited by funding something new, but they are not as excited by funding maintenance of existing software. And so this is something that's a, a challenge that, um, that it would be great to be able to change. Um, there's also the fact that some software is intentional and others is a byproduct. Right? Some software is developed to meet community needs, while other software is developed by a team to solve their own problems. And then it may or may not be shared with others. And then finally, there's an issue about career paths and incentives. Um, and so right now, developers generally don't really get rewarded when their software is used. Um, versus how they get rewarded when they write papers or when they get grants. And so this is something else that's a challenge that we really wouldn't, uh, we really should be able to address. Um, I, I should say that the, this, this work, these ideas are building in part on a paper that I wrote about four years ago um, in uh, computing and science and engineering. And so I just wanted to mention that this isn't really uh, groundbreaking, but it's hopefully pushing in a, in a, new, in a new direction. Okay, so um, having said that, um, there's six software communities that I've been starting to look at um, in high energy physics, in geodynamics, uh, in life sciences, in science gateways, in molecular science, and in a uh, different area of geoscience. And the ones that are in blue are three that I'm gonna talk about in more detail in, in just a minute. Um, the one that's in gray is one that we don't really have enough data on yet, and we're just, uh, that, that's in progress, but it's, um, it's on the, in the pipeline. Um, we're currently looking at all of these with the intent to write a collective paper with the authors, uh, with, the, with the representatives of these communities to analyze and explain um, how and why a community forms in a field to advance the software in that field. Um, what's needed for such an effort to be successful? What problems can occur and how can they be overcome? and what lessons can be learned from these communities that hopefully can help other communities. Okay, so let me, let me go ahead and uh, talk about these three communities and then I'll talk about some of the lessons that we've learned up to this point or that we think we've learned at least. Um, first is in high energy physics. Um, so the uh, experimental particle nuclear astrophysics um, community has evolved a really interesting community structure over about a 50 year period of working together. Um, there are now international collaborations that have between hundreds and thousands of people, and these are needed to build and operate and maintain instruments like, um, like the LHC at CERN, for example. Um, each instrument is used for a single experiment at a given time, but there are computation, uh, sorry, commonalities in the methodology that should lead to research software that can be widely used by different projects. Um, Having said that, a lot of software development really has been siloed within individual experiments or, or in most with one or another host laboratory. Um, and this is a problem because the software in this field is really difficult to evolve and to sustain over the years or decades that are needed for large experiments. And this leads to redundant solutions being common. So in 2011 and 2012, a cross-experiment uh, entity called the Concurrency Forum started meeting and it started discussing software challenges in, in really because of computer technology changes that were occurring. And in 2014 and 2015, some of the uh, high energy physics software people discussed a more ambitious and, and broader scope uh, for research software collaborations. And they started something called the High Energy Physics Software Foundation or HSF. Um, there is an initial HSF workshop that proposed a top-down structure similar to how the large experiments were run, but it quickly became apparent to the people in these meetings that they, uh, a duocracy was better, where uh, this would be developer-led, uh, bottom-up, and would be more productive for community building. And then they initially focused on doing um, collaborative development of a community white paper. And this white paper ended up with 310 authors signing on from 124 institutions. So, so this really was a community success um, in, in writing this white paper about what needed to be done in software over the next, I think, 10 years, if I remember right. Um, the HSF now has become a key part of the high energy physics community and it is supported by experiments and laboratories. And so this, this community white paper um, had a working group structure and it brought together experts and interested parties and, and focused technical discussions. Um, the HSF now has eight working groups 
and they're supported by half a person at CERN who does some coordination. Uh, each working group has co-conveners that are appointed annually, and they're nominated by stakeholders, either the experiments or institutions, um, as well as by volunteers. And these working groups exchange ideas and talk about common problems, and this can lead to or catalyze the community to work on new topics. The working groups can write papers to bring different experiments together and to encourage standardization when that makes sense. And more formal bodies that are outside of HSF, like the computing consortium or the um, the, well, these are both computing consortiums, um, often ask HSF to bring together community inputs um, to, to look at development plans of what's going to be needed. And so this then recognizes the contribution of HSF within this field and it recognizes its members and it helps their career advance, right? Being a coordinator is seen as something that is a, a mark of progress in your career in this field. Um, HSF then works with funded projects um, it supports funding applications and it enhances their connectivity to community and the impact of their work. And these projects then in turn coordinate, uh, sorry, contribute to the HSF working groups. And HSF also can, uh, engages with other groups and it co collaborates on regular topical meetings and virtual and physical workshops. It also runs training events. Um, and it does these regularly to help the community learn not just how to use software, but how to develop software. Okay, so um, HSF itself doesn't run software projects. Um, it runs the events that allow people from different backgrounds to meet and start common projects. And those projects then can take on a life of their own. Um, by fo fostering these funded projects, this leads to new investment in software R&D and higher recognition of the importance of software developers in their careers. Um, it's recognized as part of the HEP high energy physics uh, landscape and it links strategic bodies to the developer community. So the challenges that exist for the, for the HSF at this point are to, to make sure that it continues to be relevant to its stakeholders, uh, to continue to be relevant to the developer community, to make the next generation of developers feel involved and part of an organization, and to improve training and to engage younger colleagues through working groups. And overall, to continue to contribute to building this next generation of high energy physics software to, to make sure that it's focusing on the most important topics that are gonna be um, essential over the next 5, 10, 20 years. Okay, um, in the life sciences, to, to change for the minute, um, there is a group called Elixir, which has as its uh, mandate to unite Europe's leading life science organizations to manage and safeguard the increasing volume of data that's generated by publicly funded research. So Elixir coordinates and integrates and sustains bioinformatics resources across the member states it enables users in academia and industry to access services that are vital to their research. And as this research is becoming more data-driven and data-intensive, almost all of it requires software. Um, the fact that there is a huge volume of data and a huge volume of researchers in the life sciences leads to really a, a very fast and varied software development environment. And this development environment doesn't always follow best practices to ensure the quality and sustainability of the software. So in order to address this, the Elixir Tools Platform Best Practices Working Group was formed in 2015. And it's intended to produce and promote information standards and best practices in software development. It was initially funded by a European Union grant. And in 2019, it became part of the Elixir Core so that it's funded and supported by the Elixir infrastructure, which is supported by the Elixir member states, the, the countries in Europe. Um, this group then connects to relevant initiatives, uh, both nationally, like uh, research software engineer communities, as well as globally, like the Carpentries that does training. It engages relevant stakeholders via dedicated workshops and webinars and has a presence in the major conferences um, in the community, uh, like BOSC, and it submits a dedicated project every year at the annual biohackathon. Um, so it, it tries to be very involved in the community. It has open weekly calls to talk about short-term and long-term direction. Um, it has published papers like the four simple recommendations to encourage best practices in research software. It creates training material to provide skills to researchers and developers. And it implements a, a portfolio of fair training material in collaboration with its uh, Elixir's training activity to capture this, this range of best practices and disseminate it. Um, it's also developed what is called a, a software management plan template, and this is then connected to guidelines for open research software and, and metrics about it, 
And this is a resource for researchers, developers, funders, and publishers that's intended to elevate the quality and sustainability of research software. Um, the intent of this working group then is really to act as a catalyst towards wider adoption of standards in the life sciences for research software, um, standardizing reporting, recommending global standards. Um, this group has made significant steps towards improving the quality and sustainability of research software in the life sciences, uh, initially focused within the Elixir network, but indirectly towards life sciences work much more broadly across other countries and, and other regions as well. Um, the, the challenges then that still exist are how to improve software sustainability overall, how to identify strategies for acknowledging the scientific contribution made by research software and its developers. And the approach to community building has been largely successful. The, the regular working meetings have, have built community and they maintain momentum towards common goals. And they keep participants engaged by finding ways to work in small but consistent increments. Um, and, and a key component of this group then is the wider community. Um, the fact that it does reach out through conferences and, and hackathon projects and webinars and things like that. Um, that allows other people to get involved and allows the, the co-creation of, of outputs and lowers the barrier of adoption to these practices and to the software. And then finally, I'll just say that the, the Elixir strategy for sustaining this community is that the, this large project that's funded by multiple nations is committed to this group and making explicit connections also to other European Union level initiatives like the European Open Science Cloud. Okay, so the, the last thing that I'm going to, the last group I'm going to talk about then is a, is a somewhat different group. It's not a disciplinary group, but a technology group. Um, it's called Science Gateways. And in the early to mid 2000s, there were a set of researchers uh, working in different disciplines that engaged developers, that today we would call research software engineers, um, to ask them to help provide easier access to HPC via web interfaces for the work that these researchers were doing and wanted to make public. Um, this defined an area called science gateways that's sometimes called uh, virtual research environments or e-research or portals or virtual labs. Um, this, this effectively is an online presence for a research area. It's typically a domain specific community and it enables research access and sharing, collaboration and publishing computational tools and data sets. Um, these developers formed into groups and they created a number of what are now well-known frameworks for creating these kind of gateways. Uh, Agave, which has turned into Tapas, Aravada, Galaxy, uh, GenApp, and, and Hub Zero are some examples that have been developed um, over this period. Each framework established its own community, and um, often other investigators were unaware of these communities, and they created their own kind of either ad hoc or eventually more professional infrastructures. Um, a person in the US, Nancy Wilkins Deer at UCSD, uh, proposed studying these science gateways and was awarded a grant to do that in 2012. And over four years, um, this group held uh, a bunch of focus groups and conducted a large scale survey to learn about the needs of the community of, of these developers and users. And they proposed a Science Gateway Community Institute, in, which was awarded in 2016. Um, the goal of this institute is to turn this disparate group of developers into a community. Um, and to look at the community needs more holistically than just the software technologies. And so this holistic view includes uh, looking at the domain science, looking at software development, usability, sustainability, and workforce development. The Science Gateway Community Initiative offers uh, a number of activities. They offer extended developer support, which is something that people can ask questions to or, uh, or bring problems to where they will help do software development. Uh, it has a community engagement and exchange mechanism that has an annual conference series and monthly webinars, mailing list, and outreach. Uh, it has an incubator activity, which is really a, a workshop and a cohort program that brings together their science gateway projects, including their leads uh, and software developers, to learn about and implement software sustainability strategies for, for their software and for their gateways. Uh, it has a, a scientific software collective. It's really in some sense a catalog of, of operating science gateways and associated frameworks, as well as a tech summit series that engages the, uh, the community in forming the, the basis for how to actually work together as a community. And then it has a workforce development activity. that's a pipeline to educate students in software engineering about science gateway technologies and then to place those students as interns in science gateway implementation projects. 
So the status of the Science Gateway activity, uh, Science Gateway Community Initiative, is that these investigators now realize that they are a community and they are able to and, and do help each other. Um, they're working to recognize common problems and emerging patterns that go across disciplines and to formalize these as future cyber infrastructure and, uh, and institute service directions. The initial focus of the software collective was on establishing interoperability between the different science gateway frameworks and infrastructures. Um, and establishing those standards turned out to be hindered by the fact that people had already invested in their, their own technologies and they really were entrenched in their approaches. And so this group realized that um, by taking interoperability up a level, um, not at the software API level, but at the science use case level, um, they could bring up new possibilities between software teams where they hadn't really thought about um, how they could work together. And this enabled them to work together uh, outside of the entrenchments that they already had. Um, this really became the forum for forming this fabric of interoperating science gateways that we have today. And this is the level where domain scientists and the, and the cyber infrastructure creators can speak a common language. It isn't just software, it isn't just science, but it's really a, a kind of in between the two of them. And this um, software to science gap is really key to where the SGCI wants to go. Um, so the challenge that they have now, the, the SGCI in particular, is on focusing, uh, is, is on its own sustainability um, and how this community gets expanded um, and, and how the effort moves towards really giving each of the science gateways sustainable practices for them to, to work on. Okay, so that's the, the three communities, just to, then to talk about kind of what we've learned from those communities initially. Um, so starting with this question about how a community forms in a field and can advance the software in that field. Um, one key thing is that there needs to be some kind of initial leadership, right? Somebody needs to catalyze this work. Um, and that could happen because there might be an opportunity for funding that somebody sees and, and wants to seize upon. Uh, it could be because there's somebody energetic who just wants to change the way things work in the field. Um, and in both cases, it probably has to be somebody that's willing to try multiple things when the first thing fails, which, which often happens. Um, in terms of engagement, there needs to really be a community that has some sense of community. Um, the, there needs to be recognition that people are working on common problems, um, that they can compete in solutions, but they also collaborate when that makes sense and when collaborating uh, on common things can enable them to compete on, on different things. And the community can already be in place in some sense or it can require some community building. And then finally, um, there needs to be some kind of a vision. Right? The community needs to be receptive to this need for community work and software. And there has to be some way of agreement on what makes sense to do initially. Um, so these are kind of ideas that, that came out of the, the, the five and a half um, communities that we've looked at at this point. Having looked at these, we also then started looking at frameworks to do better understanding. And this uh, Educopia community cultivation framework is one that was particularly interesting and seems particularly applicable. And so it talks about, um, about five different aspects of community cultivation, uh, vision, infrastructure, finances and HR, engagement and governance. And in all of these, there are efforts that happen about community formation, community validation, community acceleration, and then really transition into something that is a, a sustainable activity, a, a living uh, community that's healthy. Um, and so we, we kind of looked at this in detail and we think that this is a, a useful way to keep thinking about some of these other problems that were some of these other questions that we're looking at and some of these other potential answers. So thinking about this then in terms of what's needed for this kind of effort, this community building around software effort to succeed, um, the community has to be sustained over time. Right? It can't be something that uh, maybe gets some funding. Uh, maybe there's a person that exists and, and they, they leave, they retire, something like that happens. Um, there has to be a way of continuing this. Um, and so in terms of, of vision and engagement, um, there needs to be something in, in the community for everybody, for all the stakeholders, not just the software developers. The, the software users have to see something valuable here. Uh, the funding organizations have to see something valuable. Um, the people um, who are able to be coached have to repeatedly come back for help. Um, they, they have to see this community as helping them. And this then needs to lead to some kind of productive deployment of results and telling the story of the community to others to, to really spread the idea of this community. Um, in terms of governance, this needs to expand over time. 
Um, so the leaders need to be seen as part of the community and not, not somebody outside of the community coming in to, to do something, but somebody that's emerging within the community. They need to be seen as working for the community and not for themselves. Um, and there needs to be structures that are in place to grow and update leadership as, um, again, as people, as people change, as new people enter the field from, from graduate students to, to researchers and as people leave the field. And the priorities and activities have to have a, a way of being changed beyond the initial vision that maybe, uh, that maybe got people together. Um, there may also be infrastructure needed to, to make the activities work, whether that's um, uh, things like, uh, like software infrastructure or meeting infrastructure or communications infrastructure. And there have to be finances in most cases. Um, some of these activities probably do need to be funded and maybe they can be funded by grants, maybe they can be funded by the institutions, maybe some of them are funded by, by volunteers uh, using in-kind support, um, but there's probably something that needs to be done there. And that, that does need to also be thought about in, in the path of sustainability. Um, so in terms of problems that can be overcome, um, in terms of vision and engagement, um, it, it's probably worth recognizing that, that some people just aren't gonna buy into this message um, and that the, the community needs to focus on those community members who do buy in and help propagate the community message. And, and maybe over time, some of, the, some of the others will join as well, but maybe some of them won't and you just you leave them behind and you work with who you can. Um, the idea of how the community could work together may not get buy-in initially. And it could be because this maybe wasn't the right method of organization for that community. Um, maybe the common work that was discussed was at the wrong level of abstraction. And so if these happen, it, this, this doesn't mean that the community isn't going to come together. It just means that you have to try a different way to, to bring the community together. Um, having and enforcing a code of conduct is probably pretty important at this point. Um, so I want to say that the, the code of conduct is a, is a set of guidelines for how the community works. Um, and also a means of enforcing that. So if there are people who are uh, behaving badly, it's a, a way to, to force them out of the community or at least to force them to change their behavior to, to be part of the community. Um, there are also questions about governance and, and infrastructure and finances. Uh, the initial structures can be limiting and so there needs to be a process to change them. Um, and it can be very hard to do a lot of work just as a volunteer-based organization. So as I was saying before, some funding may be needed to cover some people's time. And this could be via grants, it could be through some kind of a membership structure, or it could be through some kind of other means. Okay, and then uh, the last question is, um, I think is what, what kind of lessons can we learn from what we've looked at up to this point? Um, one of them is that making this work can be a full-time job. Uh, so the community leader um, may need to spend an awful lot of effort on this. Uh, the first try may not succeed, you may need to try again. Okay. The, the challenge here, sorry, the, the challenge here is, um, is a combination of, of social and cultural and organization and technical, right? This isn't just a question about how do you write better software or how do you develop better APIs? Um, it's how do you get people to work together and what are the incentives around that that actually make people join in? Uh, what's the organizational structure that makes that happen? Um, there are frameworks that exist based on past community studies, like the Educopia framework that I mentioned. Um, it's not focused on software communities, but, um, but it does give an idea of things to focus on and, and how to make progress. And so I think um, starting with vision and engagement is the thing that all of these communities seem to have in common, and then considering infrastructure, funding, and governance after they have that initial vision and that initial buy-in to the community. Um, and these, these communities also need to think about both their current problems as well as what are they going to do after that. Uh, I mean, it, it could be that there's a set of current problems and after those problems are solved, there's nothing else that needs to be done and that's great. Um, but in most communities, there probably will be other problems that will show up. And so how does the community shape itself in order to continue to, to address that changing set of problems over time? So just to, to wrap up, um, we've started analysis of really five out of six planned communities. These initial results I think are pretty interesting. Um, the, the ad hoc analysis that was done at the beginning generally, uh, sorry, the ad hoc analysis that was kind of done at the, at the end generally aligns with the, the initial assumptions. Um, the Educopia framework seems to be a promising way to look at these uh, communities. 
And so in the future, we're gonna finish this analysis with these six communities. Um, also look at some other frameworks in addition to this Educopia one and see if there are some others that are, that are more useful. Um, potentially test and, uh, and potentially use these frameworks and, and test some lessons in some new community um, to see if we can help a new community form and, and move forward more quickly uh, and write a paper. And so that's where things are at this point. Um, I think the way we're gonna go forward is I'm just gonna stop now and questions will come later. So, so thank you. Yep. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Daniel Patch, for your great talks. And uh, uh, next speaker is Dr. Justin Gray from NASA Glenn. Uh, please go ahead. Okay, um, I think Alicia is gonna share the slides for me because, I mean, I suppose I can give it one more try here. <clears throat> Okay, great. Alicia's got it. Um, so my talk is titled, Please Steal My Research. I'll tell you anything you want to know. Um, I actually think it's a pretty good follow-up to the previous talk. Um, yeah, there you go, full screen. Uh, mostly because I think I'm going to try to discuss in a little more concrete terms how a lot of what um, Dan just talked about could apply to the topology optimization community. Um, so go ahead to the next slide, please, Alicia. So just a little bit about me. Uh, as you heard, I'm from Glenn. I'm the technical lead for MDAO at uh, NASA's Transformational Tools and Technologies Project, and they're the ones who fund all of the work I'm going to talk about today. I've been leading NASA's Open MDAO project since 2010, and trying my hardest to build a community around OpenMDAO since that time. Uh, and if you're not familiar at all with OpenMDAO, that's okay. Uh, I, basically at a high level, I like to build software that does design optimization. Next slide, please, Alicia. Uh, I don't do a lot of topology optimization. I do a little bit, um, but here are some things that I've worked on recently. Uh, electric motors up in the top left, uh, battery, electric aircraft batteries, propellers and um, advanced propulsion concepts. These are all things I've optimized. And I've done a little bit of topology optimization research, actually mostly in collaboration with uh, Alicia Kim and her group. Um, so I'm probably just knowledgeable enough to be dangerous, but let's live dangerously. Go ahead to the next slide. Uh-oh, there you go. Sorry, hang on. Why is it not moving? There you go. So I considered a few alternate titles for this talk. Um, the first one is called OpenMDO is the best optimization framework and you should use it. Uh, and that's really getting at what Dan was just talking about in terms of reducing the amount of duplication out there. Um, we've tried pretty hard to sort of embody some of the best gradient based optimization capabilities out there and build them into OpenMDO in a way that's approachable. Uh, and I think more people would benefit if they used our tool. So it's a little self-serving, but I think it's a good title. The other title I considered was I Stand on the Shoulders of Giants. Um, I think that that's really at the heart of what we're trying to do with OpenMDAO is build off of other people's research and get other people to build off of our research. Hence the title I did settle on, which is Please Steal My Research. A little bit tongue in cheek, but I think I mean it. I mean that I would like people to either use our software or steal the ideas from it and implement it in their own versions. Um, but broadly, I think that we need to move in a direction as a community where um, not everybody writes their own topology optimization code, their own finite element solvers, their own optimizers. Um, and it really, really should sort of try to use other people's codes first. Next slide. So, OpenMDO itself is a fair optimization and modeling platform. It's really specializing in analytic derivatives, gradient-based optimization with analytic derivatives, and in particular, discrete analytic derivatives, as opposed to continuous forms of the analytic derivatives that you sometimes see in topology optimization. If you're not familiar with FAIR, it's an acronym that's being used to describe a, a new way to look at data and research in general, especially software research, uh, findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. OpenMDAO is very accessible. It has a permissive open source license. It's extremely interoperable. It has a number of APIs designed to either let it be the boss 
let it do all the, the thinking or for other things to call it. Um, and it's highly reusable sort of by design. It creates modular reusable analyses and it allows you to combine existing analyses with derivatives together to form coupled adjoints uh, with a minimal amount of coding. I think one thing that we do very differently than a lot of other research groups is we publish our code as soon as possible, um, usually far before we've ever published a paper that uses it. I think that's a little bit unique and gets to the heart of why I would encourage people to steal my research. Um, to be honest, the, the best papers on OpenMDAO didn't, uh, either OpenMDAO itself or the applications, they didn't come out till three to five years after the initial software, but the software has been open source and available the entire time. And so I would argue maybe a little bit um, out of the box thinking, but people should be more willing to publish their software before they've published a paper that uses their software. And I know that that gets into issues of credit and citation and things like that. Um, I think actually the Journal of Open Source Software uh, is a really great tool for letting people publish uh, citable in a citable way, publish their software, even though they may not have a phenomenally good application for it. So there are some tools out there in the community that can help with that. Next slide. The reason that I think this is such an important topic for, for the optimization community is that it's really, really hard to build modular and extensible optimization capability. And so often what ends up happening, especially in industry, this is true, but I think in a lot of academic contexts is that um, the optimization work gets developed by a particular person or a small group of people. And then when those people move on, it, it kind of dies on the vine, it withers. Um, you see that a lot in industry with uh, difficult challenges in, in sort of succession planning and transitioning knowledge. But I think you see it in a lot of academic labs too, where successive students aren't able to pick up where their pre predecessors left off and they choose to write their own or start fresh. Um, or as a, you know, as a PhD student moves on to become their own professor, they may feel the desire to start fresh. I know that's certainly the case in the CFD community that everybody writes their own CFD codes. Um, but also just designing reusable software architecture for complex modeling is, is really hard. Um, and so I think that's, it's, it's really hard to do the software engineering part of it. It's not training that engineers are given usually. And so there's sort of a missing skill set there. Um, but OpenMDO conquers a lot of that. We have a really good mix of software engineers and uh, more traditional engineers or you know, physics engineers, if you will. Um, and so we've, I think, been able to accomplish that. And because of that, I think the, the broader community should be willing to try and steal the work we're doing and steal some of our ideas, our development processes, and use them for themselves. Next slide. I think it's not always obvious why optimization can get so complicated, um, but I, I like this chart because it it talks about the reality that there's two kinds of complexity that show up in optimization. Um, you can have complexity in terms of the analysis itself. Certainly topology optimization lives in that world where you can have very high fidelity or dealing with millions or billions of design variables, very fine grained meshes, things like that. And that, and that makes it hard. Um, but you can also have a lot of complexity that shows up when you're trying to design systems. And you might just have 10 or 15 different kinds of physics or different analysis codes you're working with. Uh, and those two kinds of complexity, they're, they're sort of orthogonal to each other. And for a very, very long time, the high fidelity optimization community worked on the lower, the x-axis of this plot, and the systems analysis folks worked on the y-axis of this plot, and they developed different methods. And there's been a divergence in the community for a long time, sort of a break. And I'd like to think that OpenMDO sort of spans that gap. We can handle you know, tens or 15 or even 100 different analyses. Uh, and we can do it with the analytic derivative methods that enable high fidelity tools to work. Uh, and so again, I think that there's some real technological advances that have been made in terms of modularity and software engineering in OpenMDAO that are of benefit to the community uh, and that the community should steal. Um, whether it's just looking to do a coupling of two high fidelity physics analyses, maybe you want to do structural thermal topology optimization, uh, or maybe you want to couple your topology optimization into a larger systems analysis context. 
Uh, if you want to do any of those things, you should definitely be looking at some of the ways that OpenMDAO tackles those problems uh, to adopt those methods, if not to adopt the code itself. Next slide. Um, I know that the topology optimization community on this call is probably very familiar with why topology optimization is hard, but you may not have realized why systems analysis or, or big sort of systems modeling is hard. Um, this is an XDSM diagram. It's really just a data diagram. All the little dots indicate how data is flowing around. Um, but this is a diagram of an eVTOL aircraft transient model that we built uh, doing an optimization in OpenMDAO. Each box here actually represents a code. Sometimes there are subcodes inside each box. The model for this problem had something along the order of you know, 50 to 100 boxes when you zoomed all the way in. And we have to propagate derivatives through all of this, including computing adjoints for the solver loop that's shown there in orange. So this, the, these problems get quadratically harder to deal with as you add more and more boxes and you have to propagate derivatives. It's not viable to sort of hand compute an adjoint the way that the topology optimization community would normally do it for two reasons. One, it would take you forever to propagate the derivatives through each line here. And two, the structure of this model changes so often as an engineer does their work that the hand calculations you did one week would be useless the next. And so this gives you a flavor of that vertical axis, the y-axis on the previous chart, and why number of disciplines is such a key factor when you're building complex optimizations. Go ahead, Alicia, next slide. And in fact, the real problem, if I showed you the entire box, actually has twice as many boxes as I showed, uh, just to sort of hammer home the point that um, for complex systems engineering, you, you really have a massive number of data boxes floating around, and the complexity of the problem structure itself becomes a real barrier. Uh, but it is a barrier that OpenMDAO has managed to cross through. And again, uh, there's no reason to reinvent the wheel there. So I would encourage people to take a look at how we've addressed that problem and try to try to use some of our methods. Go ahead, Alicia. This is not news to anybody, but when you have a PDE solver, topology optimization obviously depends on PDE solvers. Um, the problem formulation itself can become very difficult. And this is really just saying that even if you only have one box, even if you're just doing structural topology optimization, it's still really hard to formulate a good optimization problem. And so that's a real challenge. It's the sort of the x-axis on complexity. And as you start to build more and more complex systems, you have to tackle both forms of this complexity at the same time. And if we're being honest, I think it's nearly impossible for any one researcher to ever deal with all of these problems at the same time. So I would argue that it's not just to your benefit to steal my research, but it's a necessity for the community to graduate to the level of complex to problems with the level of complexity that we know we need to get to for future systems. Um, we need to start collaborating more and working with each other's tools. Um, and I think the OpenMDAO framework provides a really good foundation. Now that's admittedly very self-serving, but it is one of the few frameworks out there that's open source, publicly developed. Everything is developed out in the open. Um, like I said, we often publish our source code far before we publish any papers with it. Go ahead, Alicia, next slide. I think the net result of all of this complexity is I don't know. I mean, I think it's a pretty natural conclusion to this, or a natural evolution to the state we're in today as a community. Uh, everybody tends to build their own software from scratch uh, because it's hard and because, like Dan said, when you start off learning, there's some value in duplication, but then you've invested some energy into your own code and you want to keep going and it's really hard to let that go rather than then switch gears and invest the time in somebody else's code. Also, there's the issue of credit. Um, then setting up cases, once you have your own code, setting up cases takes a lot of time. No why? <laughs> I've got the same thing. Everybody builds their own code from scratch twice there. So even I can't manage the complexity in my own presentation. Um, but I think that you know the Rube Goldberg-esque nature of big optimizations is that it often feels like a small miracle if, if and when your optimization works. And I've certainly had that experience myself, but I've watched others have it too. The optimization actually returns an answer and the answer makes sense. And you're all sort of sitting there kind of shocked that it worked at all. 
Um, but it can often be brittle. And if you change the boundary conditions or give it a different mesh or ask for a different problem, maybe it stops working. Um, and the only way we're ever gonna get away from this sort of Rube Goldberg nightmare that we're all sort of ignoring as an existence is to start sharing our work and building off of each other's work in a more formal way. Next slide. I think actually one of the best sort of topics to discuss in this general area is something called research debt. Um, this term research debt is actually inspired by the term technical debt, which is a very important concept in software engineering. Uh, I'd encourage you to go check out this, this blog post. Uh, I believe distill.pub, uh, which is a really interesting journal format. It's sort of in a similar vein to the Journal of Open Source Software. I believe they've actually taken a hiatus because again, to Dan's point, the the issue of managing and overseeing that project got to be too much for the original people who were working on it. Um, but regardless, this idea of technical debt and research debt, I found very foundational. Um, and I think viewed through the lens of research debt, it starts to make a lot more sense why people should be building off of each other's work, standing off of each other's shoulders. And how, you know, frankly, if, if you wanted to not have such a hard time climbing the optimization research mountain, uh, you could, you know, walk up the stairs that OpenMDAO has carved into the side of that mountain instead. Uh, so I would encourage you guys to go check out this this article on research debt. It it had a sort of profound impact on the way I view the research that I do and my contributions to the community, and I think it speaks heavily to why community shared development is so important. Go ahead, Alicia. So I've talked a lot about why the optimization community is, or research community is sort of broken in the software development sense. Now let me talk about why OpenMDO tries to fix that, what it does. Uh, one of the unique things that OpenMDO brings to the table and one of the things that I think people really should look, be looking at stealing is that it creates data pipelines that pass both the data and the derivatives between the different blocks in the model. I've seen a lot of research where the data passing and the derivative passing are treated as separate things. Uh, I'll be as bold to say is that's especially true in the topology optimization community where you all tend to use more um, continuous adjoint formulations. And so the, the path that the derivatives take through the code is sort of different than the path that you would take for an analysis. And I, I believe that we should actually be doing it in a more of a discrete, uh, consistent way. Data and derivatives should move together through the code keep related code together. Uh, OpenMDO comes with a set of robust linear and nonlinear solvers. You, you wouldn't use those to solve a PDE. For example, PDEs require highly specialized solvers, uh, but you often wrap the PDE solvers with external solvers, or you need to use these solvers for, to add in, you know, extra analyses around the PDE. And OpenMDO makes that up very easy and helps you do that in a sort of rigorous way. And then one of the big things that OpenMDO brings, which again, I think people should be looking to steal more of is built-in support for distributed memory parallelism. Now, whether you use our code or whether you just steal the data layouts that our code uses, uh, we've worked very hard to come up with a very generic, highly scalable data, data system. And that ties back into the first bullet. Our distributed memory parallelism can handle both moving data and the derivatives of data. Um, and that's something that everybody should steal. Now, the way that this shakes out in practice is that you often end up with OpenMDO as a foundational layer, and then a lot of people will build library layers on top of that. Uh, here are several that have been built, some by my team, some by external folks. And then on top of that, you might have a specific analysis for a wing or an engine or a wind turbine. And then those can all be tied together into one large multidisciplinary model. Uh, but this is sort of a visual description of how we might start relying on each other more heavily um, when we're building out work and where, you know, people can become, can get credit for contributing at each level of this stack here. All, all of those contributions should be considered equally valid. Next slide. I, I'm, I know my title is a little silly, but I, I really legitimately do want you to steal the work that we're doing um, and the libraries that we build on top of it. So here's a list of uh, well, what, five different open source software packages that we publish for our research. Um, the one that's probably the most interesting to this group is the MFIS one, which is the bottom. That was actually only made open source this week. 
but that's the one that ties with a lot of high fidelity and PDE solvers and things like that. And I would really encourage you to download code from any of there, take code from it, pull from our algorithms for your own use, copy our software architecture. Um, and please, if you do nothing else, please steal our testing framework um, and, and just add some tests to your code, follow our lead there uh, and try to make your code a little bit more robust. Next slide. So I do want to talk a little bit about what parts of OpenMDO could be useful for this topology optimization community. Uh, I think there are some specific ideas that you guys would benefit a lot from. Next slide, please. Um, actually, in a, a paper that Alicia uh, wrote, um, they showed that discrete adjoints are faster, offer faster optimizations, especially when you're dealing with coupled problems, although their paper didn't deal with coupled problems. So I'm the one asserting that coupled problems do better with discrete adjoints. Um, but I, I thought that this was really interesting. This is certainly not the only evidence that discrete adjoints are more effective than coupled adjoints uh, when you're using gradient-based optimization. But for topology optimization, um, I think we were all collectively surprised at how significant of an impact this, this made. Um, and so I would encourage you guys to start looking at discrete adjoints, whether you use the OpenMDO style of discrete adjoints or whether you lean more on um, algorithmic differentiation. The, the two work very, very well together. OpenMDO has very good interactivity with algorithmic differentiation. And so uh, I think that you know it would be really of benefit for the topology optimization community to move to a more discrete adjoint focused formulation, if for no other reason, then you could save yourselves a lot of time by using uh, algorithmic differentiation and avoid having to hand compute adjoints for every code you write. Next slide. When you start looking into multi-scale and multi-material optimizations, uh, sometimes that's called ICME, Integrated Computational Materials Engineering. Um, these problems can much, much more easily be set up with discrete coupled adjoints. And this is where the reusability of OpenMDO really comes into play here. Um, when you want to add in more things like multiple scales, uh, coupling different topology optimization formulations from different scales, solving for it, hand solving for the coupled adjoint between that entire problem is very time consuming. And you don't need to do that anymore. Uh, you should be stealing slash borrowing slash collaborating from the MDO community who figured out, you know, especially embodied in OpenMDO, how to solve coupled adjoints in a modular way. And the topology optimization community, I think, should be trying to use that. Next slide, please. And I just, I just want to be upfront here. I, I sort of, I do follow what I preach. We have stolen an awful lot from a lot of our collaborators. And here are some of the most, most important examples of places where we have literally, with, with permission, stolen some of our code, our methods, our algorithms from our collaborators. Um, the University of Michigan's MDO lab did phenomenally important work on the setup of coupled adjoints. And the foundations of that are what motivated OpenMDAO, but they're also what provided some of the important test cases and wrappers for the PDE solvers we use. Um, and we have stolen their APIs, and those are m the core foundation of what is today MFIS. So if you go check out MFIS and look at how OpenMDO integrates a PDE solver, those APIs came directly out of the, the mock work that the University of Michigan did. Also from the University of Michigan, um, but now more recently at UCSD, uh, John Wong came up with a very useful bit of theory slash algorithmic development called the modular analysis and unified derivatives uh, theory. Um, and it deals with solvers and data transfers and mathematical foundations. And you absolutely do not need to use OpenMDAO to use mod. In fact, I once, I've recently written like a 200 line of code version of OpenMDAO that implements mod. Um, but we, I mean, not only do we use his theory, but we heavily worked with some of the prototypes that he developed and incorporated those into our uh, more sort of robust framework. And so I would absolutely say that we stole a lot from the mod work. And then last, a little bit different than what you guys are used to, but there's a code that NASA developed in the early 90s to the early 2000s called the Numerical Propulsion System Simulation, NPSS. 
And uh, we stole a lot from that in terms of its modular design and how to pass data around. Not necessarily derivatives, but data. A lot of the systems analysis flavor of OpenMDAO came directly from there. Um, so I can confidently say that OpenMDAO, even though it's 14 years old, would not exist if we had had to build out from scratch all of this capability. And I'm not talking about just citing their work and re-implementing it ourselves. I'm talking about having direct access to their source code so that we could borrow from it and use ideas from it and collaborate directly with those developers. Next slide. So I think, you know, as a broad research community, we need to embrace an open, clear, and free exchange of code. I think we've always had an open, clear, and free exchange of ideas, uh, but I think that we need to focus on exchanging code. Uh, I think the Journal of Open Source Software is, is absolutely one of the best tools we have out there. I think distill.pub is great, and I hope that that kicks back off. Um, I think I would encourage everybody to use permissive licensing in their code. Uh, it still requires attribution. You will still get credit for your work, and there are versions of it where you can ensure that anybody who makes changes has to contribute those back, although I would discourage you from using those kind of viral licenses. Uh, I think permissive licenses are better. And lastly, I'd like to encourage everybody to include at least minimal regression testing in your code. If we're going to have a free exchange of code, when I pull your code down, I need to know if that code is working and when I make changes to it, I need to know if I broke anything critical in that code for you. And the only way that I can do that is if I have tests. So the more tests, the better, but at least minimal regression testing for your code would be required. Uh, if we're really going to move toward a more sharing code economy. Next slide. So that's it. Um, please steal my research. OpenMDO is out there. It's got a very permissive license, Apache v2, which says do whatever you want. Just don't sue anybody about patents, software patents. And uh, with that, thanks for your time. And I'll be more than happy to take questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Justin Gray, for your great talk on the OpenMDAO MD, MDO software. Okay, uh, as I say in the beginning, the next uh, is followed by an open discussion on the open source software benchmarking things in our community. And this will be uh, moder moderated by Professor Ali Shekin. So thank you both to Dan and Justin for this really inspiring and um, uh, 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 very um, comprehensive talks in, in um, one obviously from sort of the, the open source and data where science has been very much in, um, uh, uh, advanced and, and benefited from, from that. And then I guess MDO is a sort of adjacent community um, that has been ad adopting some of these um, practices. So um, we've um, sort of wanted to leave the time for questions altogether and make it into an open panel discussion rather than sort of take the questions immediately after. So, so I would, um, and there are some questions that are already on the chat. So maybe what I'll do is to start with by just pointing at Mohammed who put in the first question and perhaps you might want to ask your question. Sure, uh, can you all hear me? Yes. Can anybody? Yes. Hear? Okay. Good. Yes, we can hear you. Um, right. So I already asked my question to Daniel, and he answered me. So let me jump to the second and third question. Uh, so first, thank you both for your great and inspiring talks. Uh, so I have a question about OpenMDO uh, and how it handles the kind of iterative process of fine-tuning formulations, algorithms, uh, etc., which like often. Uh, is the case a lot of the time to get even like a single block working correctly. Uh, so if it's if the process of design is not fully automated, even on a single block level, how can OpenMDO automate the entire process in that case or help it in the can't. entire process? It can't. Uh, <laughs> right. OpenMDO does not and will not ever replace an engineer who knows how to use optimization. That's That's not its job. Its job is to make it easier for you to couple blocks together. So if a single block doesn't work, if you can't do an optimization on a single system, you're right, there's, there's no chance that you're gonna be able to do a, a multidisciplinary thing. Um, in fact, I, I often think that OpenMDO has done itself a bit of a disservice. 
I call it an arms race. There's an arms race between the developers of OpenMDO and the users. Every time we make it easier to build a problem, the users immediately expand their problem to the complexity level that is at the limit of their understanding of how to solve. Um, and then sometimes they get frustrated because OpenMDO doesn't work properly when really they just don't know how to pose an optimization. And so yeah. in a sense, we've made it too easy to build complex optimizations and you can build one and not have any idea why it doesn't work. OpenMDO does a few things to help with that. We've built in debugging tools and things like that. But fundamentally, if your PDE solver is not converging or it's not robust enough to stand up to optimization, uh, OpenMDO doesn't, it's not going to help with that. Do you think there is future for something like human in the loop optimization where uh, instead of fully automated, like semi-automated semi optimization? I think we already do that. Um, I just have a different version of it. Uh, I don't ever plan to press a button and have the optimizer spit out a final design. I still do large design sweeps. Um, I just do design sweeps of optimized configurations. So there, there may be, say, 100 design variables in your space. Of those, maybe five of them are critically important design variables that you as the engineer want to control. The other 95 just need to take the right values. Um, and so I would sweep the space and do you know, a design of experiments of optimized configurations. Um, and that's why using analytic derivatives with gradient-based optimization is so important. Uh, because when I'm running thousands of optimizations, they better be very, very fast, very, very convergent. And you just can't get that kind of performance with gradient-free algorithms usually. All right. Um, do we have any other questions? If you've got questions that you want to just put in the chat, that's okay. But put your hand up as well if you want to. Well, Mohammed had one second question about how many non-NASA non funded developers OpenMDO has. Uh, that's a really good question. The answer is... I don't know how you would define a core developer, but there are roughly, we'll say there's six NASA funded full-time developers of OpenMDAO. Um, and then externally, I don't know that I would call anybody a core developer, um, but there are groups of let's say roughly, there's roughly 10 people around the country, actually around the world, uh, who have made meaningful contributions to OpenMDAO to different parts of it. Um, again, I, I wouldn't call them core. They're not, their full-time job is not to develop OpenMDAO, but uh, meaningful contributions to the data, the data transfers, the algorithms, the optimizations, the user interfaces, things like that. So about 10 people have made meaningful contributions to OpenMDAO that are not funded by NASA. Hey, um, okay. so Thank I you. Guess one way of, uh, of thinking about that is, are, would any of them have permission to commit their changes? Uh, no, <laughs> um, but well, permission to, you mean like to hit the merge button? Yeah, or to no. review somebody else's change and say it, it's approved and yes, it gets credit. We do accept code reviews from other people, but I did the, yeah, the, the answer to your question is no. I, we, we only allow, I mean, as a government organization, we, we maintain the sort of the nuclear merge button is, is ours. Okay. Um, and that, that topic came up along the lines of benevolent dictator for life. That came up at a community meeting we had. Um, I actually just publicly asked if they wanted NASA to continue being the benevolent dictator for life. Uh, and, the, and the resounding community answer was yes, they did not want that responsibility. Um, so I, I suppose if it ever changed, if OpenMDO grows to the point where there's maybe an outside organization who's equally as uh, uh, involved, we would consider giving them commit permission. Okay. The, the reason I was asking is that sometimes in some of the things that I've been doing, we, we talk about the difference of community um, open source versus community governance of open source. And that the, kind of that governance piece is, is kind of hard to give up sometimes. So. Okay, Niels, question. Oh, I, I think it was Ahmed before me. So Ahmed, please go ahead. Oh, was it? Sorry, I missed it. That's fine, oh. Neil. You can go ahead. I can go after you. So go ahead. Okay, so... So this is a tricky question, I think. So let's see if I can phrase myself. So I guess most of us consider ourselves as uh, algorithm designers. And most have a certain way of doing this, meaning that most working with topology optimization are mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, not computer scientists. So to some extent, I think, Everybody has kind of their own way they want it to be. 
So I think my question would be something like how to agree on where to start. I mean, does, does that make sense? Because I mean, we, we kind of need to. So. Yeah. I would say the answer to that question is not simple. OpenMDAO had a real problem of where to start. Um, and in our case, we started with the computer scientists and we kind of gave them some prototypes that the algorithms people had made mm -hmm. and the computer scientists kind of took a stab at it and we hated it. Um, they didn't get the APIs right. So I guess my answer to you is I would always start at the APIs. I would sort of look at the input and output of what your code is supposed to do. And I would design those really carefully. Um, and I think that applies whether you're doing algorithm design or software design. If you get those right, and it doesn't have to be perfect on the first time, but that's where I, when I iterate, that's where I start to look at. Do I have the right APIs? Because that's what makes a code understandable and usable by others. Um, and I would say the same if you're looking to contribute to a code and try to figure it out, instead of jumping to their source code and seeing how it works, go look at their APIs. If you can understand their APIs, you'll be able to figure out the rest. Mm. Yeah. Would you like to comment? Yeah, well, yes, and I, yeah, but I'm not sure. Um, okay, so, so if we're just looking at the API, how we interface the different codes, I would say, what what has stopped me in the past from using any of these like MFM, DL2, Phoenix is it's not the APIs, but it's the when I want to push somewhere at the very bottom of the whole thing. Even though I get the APIs of let's say uh, MFM, getting to where I can actually change the part of the source code that I really want to change seems like a very steep mountain to climb. Did you ask the developers for help? No, I wrote my own code. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, I have a colleague at RPI who uses MFEM, and I know Alicia is looking into Phoenix, and I actually know both of those communities are very helpful. Um, and I would say with OpenMDO, the same is true. I make an effort to answer almost every email I get, every Stack Overflow question. Um, ask before you go write your own code, right? They're usually more than happy to have people messing around in the guts of their code and to point you in the right direction. Okay, thank you. Okay. Cool, Ahmed. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, Justin, and thank you, Daniel. I have one comment regarding the discrete and continuous adjoint method that Justin mentioned, and then my question is uh, toward the Daniel. So it, it, uh, using a discrete uh, actually adjoint or discrete sensitivity, it is a common practice, even in the, this community, many people they are using and uh, even there are many papers that even compare, uh, compare actually the advantage and disadvantage of each one. Just I, would, I wanted to, uh, you made the comment. It looks that in this community, mostly we are focusing on the continuous adjoint sensitivity, but it is a common practice. But uh, Daniel, so have you look at the biophysics community? So you presented some of the life science community, how they are developing and how they are developing, uh, contributing to the, the code development in those sciences. So have you look at the biophysics community? For example, the groups in the, the place you are in Illinois, in Beckman. So in the biophysics groups over there, NAMD and VMD, and how they structured the community to two groups that they are working closely some of them is, are just code developer and they, they are interested in developing the code and some other community, some uh, people in the community, they are working as a scientist using that code to answer a scientific question. Um, so the, the quick answer is no. Um, I, I, I know the, the folks that are doing that fairly well. Um, uh, I, I work with Sanjay Kale, who's on the VMD side on, on a different project. Um, and, and so the, the reason that the answer is no is that what I'm, what I'm trying to do in this project is not to look at specific projects, specific software, but to look at communities across disciplines. And so the question that I would try to ask, and I don't know the answer at all, is do you feel like there is a recognized biophysics community that has a sense of community at this point that I could study. 
uh, not just a software project and the people around that software project, but a uh, right, but but all the the related projects that also need to work together, so that um, so that people can can answer biophysics questions. So the, I cannot answer this uh, very accurately, but for for a short amount of time that I was there. There was several uh, project, open source code project for, from different places in the US or in the Europe, but they had the, the sense of the community and they interact with each other, even in the developing the codes, they have the, some workshop or the seminars or conferences focusing in this building the community, but I'm not a good person to answer this. But okay. the, why I brought that, it was when I was there, honestly, I saw how they are working together and getting the credit. Because when you have an open source, the big answer is who get the credit. So over there, I saw mm -hmm. that. So answering to the scientific question, it is different with the answering uh, or making a code that can be used for uh, to find the answer. So yep, yep. both groups, they get the, the credit, but many people in the community, they don't need to be involved in the code developing. As Nail mentioned, we are not uh, um, some computer scientists. We are mostly mechanics or civil engineering or the people we are understanding the physics. So that is the main difference over there. I saw they have a distinguished a line that can you say you are belong to the which part of the subgroup if you wanted to yeah so I, 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 yeah so I would actually disagree with you a little bit and say that I that the way that I look at it is there's there's at least three different groups involved there right there's the the the, the Klaus Schulten's former group um, which was focused on the science application and developing the software for that science application. Um, Sanjay Kale's group, which was building the computer science infrastructure and building the software for that computer science infrastructure. So, so to me, there's really kind of these three different groups. There's the computer science researchers. There are the, um, I don't know, let's say the, the biophysics researchers. And then there's the software developers who could be on one side or the other side or could be crossing uh, both. And so the, the, one of the issues that came up is that the software developers there still were not getting credit really in either of those cases, right? Their, their software is being used. Um, and sometimes they might be on a paper about the software, but, um, but they didn't really get credit for their work, right? The, the, the scientists that use the software would give credit to the software and they would get credit for the scientific discoveries. So I, so I feel like there's still a, a problem there, even though it's a, it's a great collaboration between computer science and biophysics, where both of the researchers are getting credit in their own disciplines and working together to deliver something for the community. I don't feel like the software developers who are involved at a lower level really got the credit that they deserved. Yes, that's a good point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Me? Hi, yeah, this is Min uh, from Atair. Uh, thanks for the inspiring talks from both. Um, so yeah, my, I have two questions to Justin. And uh, so like Daniel, laid out the um, landscape for open source code communities is vital, right? So you mentioned that there's a limited number of uh, contributors, but do you have a like, network of users of the uh, software? I do. Um, a little bit ironically, I have no idea how big that network is, um, but I would estimate it in the several thousand users. Um, okay. uh, at every conference I go to, I'm surprised somebody tells me they're using OpenMBO for different things. I converse regularly with about 200 people. Um, it's a rolling cast of about 200. Um, but I, and I can extrapolate from there as to how many are actually using it. Uh, we get about a thousand downloads a month. Anytime we publish a new chunk of software, downloads downloaded about thousand to 1500 times. Um, and when we hosted a community workshop, we had 50 different organizations attend to present their applications that they were using OpenMDAO. Um, and interestingly, that, that workshop was where I asked the benevolent dictator for life question, so. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, so you, you, you do have a community around the, around the code, maybe not core contributors as many, but. Uh, uh, so we do a lot of users, yeah. yeah. Okay, so related to that, uh, 
do you collaborate with commercial software? Like I work for commercial software, although we have also a couple of open source projects. So do you work with commercial with software? Do you, do you feel like uh, open and also uh, excited about them stealing your code? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I would love it. Um, there's several companies who I've begged to steal my code, um, and I'd be totally fine with it. Um, I actually think there's a lot of MDO frameworks out there that could benefit from it. But yeah, we, we're happy to work with commercial, uh, commercial companies. Uh, sometimes the contracting details can get a little tricky, government organizations collaborating with one specific industry partner, but that, that can be worked around. And yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, as long as they admitted they were doing it, we would be happy okay. to have them steal our code uh, and put it in their product. That would be phenomenally good for us. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. So at Affair, we, we open source the two platforms. One is PBS, it's for the workload management, which was actually created by NASA originally. Mm -hmm. And uh, another like a mass platform that tries to build a platform that people can develop code between all the open source language like uh, MATLAB, uh, C, and uh, Python. But I think we, we struggle somewhat to build an active uh, community. I think that is a challenge. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, look, building a community is always extremely hard. Um, I don't even have any good, I wouldn't even say we did a good job of it in OpenMDAL. Um, I would say we we survived despite doing a bad job of it initially. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in on Justin's uh, first comment, first answer for a second, and say that that's, that this question about who's using your software is something that nobody in open source has a good answer for yet. Um, it's it's one of these really big community challenges, right? That the the things that you can easily count, like downloads, don't actually tell you anything useful. And the things that you'd really like to count, like how is your software being used in an engineering product or a science product are almost impossible to find out. Um, and so that's one of the places that we hope citation, software citation actually picks up at some point, um, but it isn't really there yet in, in practice. Um, and then the last thing I was just going to say on that really quickly is that um, uh, GitHub is actually very interested in this as well, because they would like to be able to, to look at a repository and say, what's the impact of that repository? Um, and they don't have any idea how to do this either. So they're, they're actively looking for people with ideas that they could potentially even fund uh, to explore this. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah, I hope, I think at the last conference, we, we talked about potentially building an open source community for uh, optimization software, topology optimization, for example. And uh, yeah, that hopefully your, your talks will inspire such activities. <laughs> Thank you. Carolina. Hello. Um, so I have first question that's Justin specific and then kind of a general question to both Justin and Daniel. But I was wondering when you were first conceiving OpenMDAO or for when you first proposed it or got funding for it, what was the project goal or the deliverable in mind? Like, were you saying like, I want to create a platform to do X um, and then it kind of in general, like, how would you recommend or do you have like a thought process for how do researchers who are often like, right, PhD students or just graduate students that like their project goal or deliverable is graduating or like, right, a lot of the times it's just like getting a paper out. How do you weigh that versus software development and building something that can be used by someone besides yourself and sometimes even not even yourself like a few months later, right? <laughs> Justin, you're muted. Thanks. You'd think I'd be better at this by now. Um, the original goal of OpenMDAO was to bring high fidelity tools into the systems design process. Um, and to be honest with you, I don't think we really succeeded in that until about 2018. So 18 years after, or eight year, uh, yeah, 18 years after we started. No, sorry, eight years after we started. But um, and, and the project was conceived as open source from the beginning. We knew that this was something we wanted people to be able to use and use freely, and especially companies and organizations or commercial framework providers. Um, so that was sort of a key tenant of what we built. I think your second question is more important. Um, the answer is that it's mostly 
on the responsibility of your advisor at first to enforce it, good software practices should not slow you down tremendously. The only time they do is if you're trying to fix the bad software practices that came before you. Uh, and that's what technical debt is or research debt. Um, so I would say, you know, your advisor, if you are an advisor, you should be investing in good software from the start to ensure that the people who come later can be successful. Um, if there's a big technical debt problem, it's not necessarily, it may be incrementally faster. You may think it's incrementally faster for you to kind of hack around and ignore the problems. Um, but I've never actually seen that be true in practice except maybe one time. I think it just feels faster because you kind of tend to make like a lot of progress initially and then you end up with this really long tail. Whereas good software practice tends to give you more of a linear progression. Um, but yeah, I think the answer is it's, it's a lot on the sort of the group's advisor, the leader, the professor who is responsible for sort of carrying through over time. Um, but if, if the software, if the technical debt in a group is too large, then you're right. Sometimes you don't have a choice but to kind of start over from scratch. I just hope when you start over that you use good software practices in round two. Dan, I'm wondering if you want to also have an alternative view from a discipline, different discipline. Um, no, I don't. Not particularly. I think that was. I, I don't. I think I would agree with that pretty much. Okay. 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 So, um, since Ming's here, um, I think one one of the things that I might ask you also is um, is to sort of say that um, you know a lot of engineering software um, actually sort of you know, contains the sort of the, the know-hows and the intellectual properties. And it's, that's really what they make sort of money out of. So, so essentially um, the commercial software is, is what's um, most commonly uh, used in engineering industry. So do you see um, engineering software, the commercial software as it is an open source coexisting and have different roles or do you see them conflicting um how do you what what are your views okay th thanks for the question Alicia. i i think that uh, um there is a future of open source commercial software uh, that's uh, that's our experiment like we we have uh, uh, three open source platforms one is the pbs which is the uh, work node management software another is the open metrics that's the mass tool we, we we try to create and another is the uh, uh, Kratos, we are deeply involved. Um, so, for example, with PBS, uh, our business model is open source commercial. So we have the open source, and uh, but we also sell commercial license. And uh, uh, believe it or not, uh, most uh, uh, companies, large organizations, they, they don't have the bandwidth to manage the open source software. So <laughs> they would rather take commercial software, but. Once you open up the community, actually you'll get contributions from uh, many channels. And uh, you, so if you could build a, a active community, the key is active community, I think. If you could build an active community, you could develop much faster in terms of uh, technology. I think that has tremendous future, but then the key is to really how to, uh, create a vibrant community that's that's a challenge i think like justin said it's it's not necessarily easy to create some community daniel laid out the landscape there are a few but it's not too many platforms that has a very large community so thank you so so as ming mentioned um one of the things that did come up during the um, last conference at wcsmo in boulder online uh we had a, um, a level of interest on some of these open source and community working together to advance sciences in our community uh, in topology optimization and um i hope this actually had given you a few things to think about dan you would like to make some maybe final comments yeah, well, no, I was just going to um, actually say to Ming uh, on his oh, point, yes. these were the six communities where I knew people and could reach out effectively and get people to write about their community on short notice. 
Um, I think there actually are more than these six, um, but th these were just the six where, where it was easy for me to get somebody that I personally knew to volunteer to, to spend some time helping and collaborating. Great. Cool, thank you, thank you. So I hope some of these things sort of gave you some, um, things to think about um, if you're students, obviously, as you're you know, continuing to your code your method. And if you're advisors or, or, or um, professors, then um, how you might want to manage your software within the group. Um, so with that, thank you very much. And thank you, June, for giving the, um, the top webinar session to, to, give, um, to have this discussion over to you. Uh, thank you, Daniel and Justin, for a very inspiring talk. And thanks to Alicia and Jerry for organizing this uh, very lively discussion. It's wonderful. Um, normally, at the end of the session, I will announce what will happen next month. Uh, but however, this time, we have not planned a specific session for March. We have been running this topology optimization webinar for two years. So today is the 20th session. And it has helped our community stay collected during this uh, difficult period, and we intend to continue. But um, considering the changes of the circumstance we are in, I mean, uh, the COVID is not completely gone, but many parts of the world are opening up and the uh, conferences either in-person or hybrid are coming back. Considering this change, we are in a process of considering a reorganization of this topology optimization webinar. So, we would like to hear your suggestions on uh, what uh, should we change and how we change it for the next phase of topology optimization webinar. So in the coming days, I will send a question there to get your feedback and get your ideas. Uh, we really appreciate your suggestions. So if you have any comments, suggestions, please let us know. Um, again, thank you for joining us today and uh, stay safe and have a nice day. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Bye.